Can you work that? Well, I can try. You see, I am already electrified. The museum has only enough money to get one of these, and they think that in the 21st century they will get uh, another one of these and um, a CD player. By then, of, by then, of course, there won't even be classical music, so it won't matter. Well, we're going to start off with an argument, I can see. <laughs> All right, well, that's a big, that's a big topic, but I want to uh, say that Ellen Zillick is, in my opinion, one of the finest people in music in the world. I've known so many people in the music world, and I don't know that anyone is a better person. I mean, I've never heard you say anything bad about anyone. And I know because I say bad things about everyone. So uh, we've known each other for at least 15 or more years, probably more. 1974. Really? Mm -hmm. And that's when I came to know your music. And I played some of the first tapes on WNCN. In fact, I think I was one of the first people to champion your music. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to tell you just a moment about Ellen's career. Ellen Zwillick uh, was born not in Brooklyn like Copeland, but even worse, I think, Miami. <laughs> uh, a composer from Vienna, I understand. But Miami, how was it growing up in Miami and uh, getting into music? And tell us a little bit about your roots. Uh, well, Miami is where I was born, and um, I guess I was not the usual person there, although I do love water sports and things like that. Um, I'm sure that's in, my, in that background. Um, but I became interested in music at a very, very early age, and um, I was the sort of child whose mother had to say, why don't you stop playing the piano and go out and play like the other kids? Um, and music very early on became very much the center of my life and I just can't imagine living without it. I want you to know that Ellen is not just a composer, she is a darn good violinist. Do you still practice? No, I don't, I don't have time. The composing is that occupying? Yeah. Oh yeah. For seven years she was in the American Symphony Orchestra with uh, Leopold Stokowski as the conductor at that time. What was it like to play under Stokowski, who's still a controversial musician. Um, incidentally, after I was born in Miami, um, in this <laughs> um, rather inelegant way, shall I say, um, <laughs> I did a few other things, including come to New York and get my doctorate at Juilliard, and um, I studied violin very seriously. And for a long time, I was trying to sort of balance, juggle everything. Um, and. In answer to your question about the American Symphony um, and Leopold Stokowski, as I look back on that experience, um, it gets richer by the year, like many things in our lives that sort of accumulate. Um, he was a maddening person to work for. He was rather cruel. Hmm. Um, and um, we lived on, I worked there for seven years, but we had no kind of security. It was really strictly a concert to concert um, uh, event. And, and um, one year he fired, I think, 16 violins. And, you know, really it was, it was very, very difficult in that sense. But um, for me, as a young composer, it was just wonderful because we had, in addition to Stokowski, who, with all of his flaws, um, nevertheless could do a certain kind of repertory in a way no one else could do it. Mm -hmm. And he had an insight into musical phrasing and, and sound and how to let people play and things like this. It was just extraordinary. And there were some wonderful moments there. Was he cruel to you ever? Uh, he made me cry once, actually. <laughs> um, um, when I, I was very young, just in the orchestra, we were playing the New World Symphony. And we had, um, I had a part that looked like it was from Dvorak's time. And my stand partner was, um, maybe you don't know, but in, in string sections, one player turns while the other keeps playing. And I was on the outside, so I was supposed to keep playing while my partner turned. And he was always a late turner, you know, and he would, at the last second, he would sort of go, mm, and reach mm. over and throw the page across. And it didn't bother me, because I, I knew it was on the next side anyway. But uh, this one day, he did this, and the page ripped in a 
cloud of dust rose, and I thought it was very funny, and mm. I laughed. And Stokowski stopped the whole orchestra and, and screamed at me and pointed a long finger at me and told me I had a, a bad spirit. And um, He's mm. actually the only conductor that ever made me cry, and I, I, I'm so embarrassed, you know, with sitting there as a young person and the whole orchestra looking at you. And uh, Ellen, life is so full of hazards, and I never thought, though, of the late Turner. <laughs> Ted Turner, yes, who will no doubt win the Nobel Prize for peace. And his brother, Paige? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, you I, know, ha I have you what already... What I was going to say about the, the American Symphony that was so interesting to me is that we had a veritable parade of, of guest conductors, yeah. um, some of whom were, you know, major figures at the time, like Carl Berm, Eugen Joachim, Ernst Answer May. Yes. I played whole concerts with Aram Kachaturian, with, with Berio, with Henze, with um, just the, the Paul Kletsky, the, just kind of the cream of the crop. And more modern music than you would usually oh, get. Oh, tremendous amount of modern music. So it music. was a great grounding for you. Wonderful. And just sitting there in the orchestra, and I truly believe that there's no way to make art without getting dirt under your fingernails. Um, is, is, it's an invaluable experience to know what goes into making a performance and what, what it requires uh, the, a way you cannot learn if you just go to a dress rehearsal and a concert and you know you, you don't really have any idea what's going on plus the fact that there's so many different perspectives so many different ways to come at music and it was really a, a wonderful educational experience for me to mm -hmm. sit there and, and each week practically get a whole other world view of what music is and whether you you take rubato whether you don't yeah. uh, uh, to, to learn um, a Bruckner symphony with Eugen Joachim conducting. Yes. Where it's in his blood and he's trying to give it to you. It's just really wonderful. And Stokowski goes back to, you know, a romantic tradition which just Absolutely. is extraordinary. Did he really have that magical alchemy in, in making an orchestra produce a, 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 a beautiful tone in the violins or was, or was there a method to it? Well, you know, it's very interesting. I think the the less you know about conducting, the more you understand it. Mm -hmm. um, I felt, you know, when I went charging into the American Symphony as a young person, you know, um, taking on the world, you might say, I, I thought I knew quite a bit about it. After those seven years, I've really never been quite so sure. I mean, I think mm -hmm. there's almost something um, mystical about it in a way. There's a kind of a communication. For mm -hmm. instance, yes. Carl Böhm had a really absolutely terrible stick technique, uh, the ability to really convey with his baton exactly what he wanted you to mm -hmm. do. Um, and his, even his talking to you in rehearsal was not like someone like Eugen Joachim who could explain how to do something. He would sort of complain and you know, threaten to take the next plane back to Vienna and, and that sort of thing. And yet, somehow or other, his knowledge of the score got communicated, mm -hmm. his excitement, his, his understanding. It is it. a mystical thing. It, 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 there's, there's no doubt about it. What is conducting? I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. Virgil Thompson once said that uh, the pianist has to, um, has to cook the dinner, but the uh, conductor has it catered. But... <laughs> It's, it's much more than that, of course. Um, but look, we have you playing violin in the uh, American Symphony. We have you born in Miami. But I think it's important that you went to school at Florida State. You studied with, uh, uh, what's his name? The one who wrote uh, Susanna, Carlisle Floyd. Uh, no, actually, I didn't study with Carlisle. I studied did you know with, him there? Yes, Dr. I Nani? did know him. Uh, Doc Nanya didn't really teach composition, and I was also too young. He, what he taught, he taught to the graduate students. But, uh -huh. um, and this is Ernst von Doc Nanya, um, the wonderful Hungarian composer, pianist, yes, conductor. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, David, by the way, I had a wonderful thing this year. His grandson, Christoph von Doc Nanya, who's the, mm -hmm. now the Cleveland. music director of the Cleveland Orchestra, just premiered a work of mine. Mm. It was a real nice coming around. That, but I played, for the, I played for the old man's conducting class. Um, Doc Nani. Yeah. Yes, he's almost forgotten. He was born around 1877 in Hungary and he was the czar of piano teaching. Oh, and then yeah. he came to Florida State and he died uh, around 1960. So he, had yeah. a, he was like one of the great, uh, the last in the link of the virtuoso composer.
He was an incredible pianist, even wonderful, in the 80s. wonderful. But let's not talk about them now, because you know what have you been doing? I know that you just had, <laughs> and everywhere I read your name, uh, you won, and you're the only woman to have ever won the Pulitzer Prize for music. That was a great, I think, boost in your career. Shulamit Rand won it this year. Really? Yeah. Uh, now. Every orchestra wants to do your music. Uh, isn't it recent that you just had a Chicago Symphony? You, I see that you just did that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Knock on wood. I hope this is wood. Yeah. Um, ten days ago, yeah, the, uh, I had a premiere with Baron Boyman and the Chicago Symphony. Of what work? This was a, a, a concerto for bass trombone, timpani, strings, and cymbals. You love many different instruments. Yes, you know, I it's, do. it's. You've written a piano concerto, a flute concerto, and I think... Would you like to hear a little bit of your trumpet concerto to begin with? Um, yeah, I suppose I should confess something else. Mm -hmm. I also played, in addition to the violin, I played the trumpet, um, especially in high school and um, in no. college. Oh, yes, I, I played the Haydn concerto. and. You know, at Juilliard, when I went there, uh, and if you were a trumpet player, all the pianists would say, that's an animal. <laughs> um, that's a compliment for, for a brass player. In fact, the, um, the, bra the trumpet player that's on this recording, it's Philip Smith, who's the, the principal trumpet at the New York Philharmonic, and it's a recording with Phil and Zubin Mehta conducting a small ensemble. Um, and Phil is a, th the sweetest man you would ever want to meet. He, I don't think he ever raises his voice above a mezzo piano. But uh, his nickname at Juilliard was the animal, in fact. And amazing. <laughs> Just amazing. Let's hear some of that. We don't have time for it. It's around a 15-minute work, right? Yeah, a little more. Let, raise your hand when you're ready to have it over with. Okay, this okay. is um, eight, uh, 84, and it's a concerto for trumpet and five players who play about eight different instruments. Let's go. <laughs> Good. <laughs> we'll hear more of her music later. I wish we could hear that piece. It's captivating. It's Ellen, on a CD. Had, it's it's on a CD also. Well, we can't hear the CD here yet until the 21st century, but uh, I guess you could buy it at Tower Records. Uh, Ellen, um, you, um, you're a woman composer and yet you're played everywhere. That doesn't seem to have gotten in the way at all. Can you tell us a little history of being a woman and a composer? Because in the 19th century, it really was a taboo. Uh, Mendelssohn, for instance, wouldn't even think of letting his sister Fanny become a composer. And when he was, uh, um, had an audience with Queen Victoria, and Victoria sang 
several of Mendelssohn's songs, he was very upset that one of the songs that Queen Victoria sang was by Fanny Mendelssohn, his sister. And he said, oh, that's because he didn't even want her to have it published under her own name, so it was published under his name. And he said, um, uh, your majesty, that's my sister's song. Can you sing another one of mine? And uh, he wrote a, you know, a letter about this, and it was absolutely a taboo. Liszt, probably the most liberal man in the 19th century, refused to let Cosima study composition, so she had to marry Wagner, which was a monumental chore for the poor lady. But um, uh, have you had any of these taboos in your life? Well, it's very interesting to me that um, I have, since I won the Pulitzer Prize and I, I really had so much publicity as a, you know, because I was a woman to have won it, um, I've had to think about it in a way that I never did before because I grew up in post-World War II America. Um, and I think that, you know, you've mentioned my professional playing, but my whole life, I was playing in bands and orchestras, and you might gather, I play a little jazz, mm -hmm. I play a little jazz trumpet. Um, and I grew up in an environment where it was perfectly normal mm -hmm. for girls to do this sort of thing, insofar as American culture accepts making music as a normal thing anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was certainly perfectly normal for a, a girl, and my teachers, you know, were great fans and supporters and urging me on. And um, when I came to New York, you mentioned the American Symphony. Um, at that time, the American Symphony was unusual in that it was um, probably about half women. Um, it was also unusual at that time to have um, black people in the orchestra and um, oriental people in the orchestra, which was something quite new also. Um, so. I would say that, that I have just kind of been born, I may not have been born in the most uh, romantic spot, but I, I was born at the right time. I mean, mm -hmm. if I had been born yes. 20 years earlier, I think um, there would be no possibility. Um, and the thing that I've come to realize when I think about the history of music and the history of composers and um, the history of women composers, which is, there is a history of it, and it's quite fascinating, um, that music is, writing music is more like writing a play than doing any of the other arts. It's not like writing a poem or a novel or, you know, where you really do just need that 500 pounds in a room of your own, um, or like working as a, as a visual artist. Um, it's more like writing a play. And if the theater is completely closed to women, as it was, um, to the extent that women's roles were taken by men, um, then it's not shocking that you, you don't have women playwrights, because the playwright grows out of the theater. And I believe the, the composer grows out of the performance tradition. Um, it's not imposed on the performance tradition. It's something that naturally, naturally grows out of it. Um, so the fact that in, in post-World War II America you have a different attitude about um, opening things up to women, I think, is, is the key. And yeah. now, you, for instance, if you go to the, I was just at the Chicago Symphony, as you mentioned, like 10 days ago. That used to be strictly, a, you know, a male organization. Um, that's no longer true. There are a lot of, you know, women winning auditions and showing up on the stage. Um, the artistic man administrator is a, is a woman. It's, you know, it's sort of like become a natural, yeah. normal thing. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's, it has to be seen as a social phenomenon. It's not a um, biological phenomenon, certainly. I mean, I think the creative impulse is in everybody, and I think it's, it's put down in far too many people. And I always ask myself the question when it comes to the case of, say, Felix and Fanny Mendelssohn. I mean, I'm so happy that Felix Mendelssohn was nurtured. His music is wonderful, and it's made a difference in my life. But what did the, <clears throat> what did the world gain um, that Fanny's music was not nurtured? Yes. 
um, instead always, the world lost something. It always so. bothers me. I think probably that maybe Mozart's sister, uh, Maria Anna, was maybe more talented than Mozart. My God, what if what if that was true? It's hard to imagine anybody being more talented than Mozart. But she was she was an amazingly yeah. gifted, and of course she was suppressed immensely after you know uh, after her tenth year. So um, who knows what she would have? Been. And, and contrast that with you know um, somebody said something. Um, Quoting George Sell when the Cleveland Orchestra uh, premiered my oboe concerto this year, as I, I mentioned, and someone went up to the um, chief donor for the Cleveland Orchestra and said that quoted George Sell as saying that um, commissioning a composer is like putting money in a slot machine and, and pulling the handle. And fortunately, the person also went on to say that that he hit the jackpot, but. Um, there's something very interesting about that. I, I can, don't like that image, but it is more like betting on a horse. Mm -hmm. And there are horses that run well most of the time and some that occasionally run very well. And, um, but the best horse is not going to run his best all the time. So what I'm saying is that there is something to this image of putting your money on a composer. And in order to do that, there has to be a belief. And if, if you have ruled off, ruled out half of the human race before you begin to look around, um, if you think that a woman cannot do this, yes. you're doing a chancy thing anyway. You're, you're placing yes. a bet. I've been bet on by, mm -hmm. say, the Chicago Symphony or the New York Philharmonic or something. And not only the, not the money, the effort, the time, the people, the performers have to feel this person can do it. This, this is something that... Uh, it's a very dynamic social interaction, actually, I think. Um, we sometimes forget that because we, we spend a lot of time alone when we, we grow up as musicians and when we, we practice or we write. It, there's a great deal of solitude. But the, the whole impetus behind this is this great um, sort of incredible intimacy with, even with people who are like Mozart who are long dead. Yes. Who's, who've touched our lives. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and it, it the really is. The connections are unbelievable, you know, because there's always the performer, there's an audience, there's, you know, now a, a mass media which can, you know, bring music as it's never even dreamed of. I mean, Mozart never even thought that a piano concerto would be ever played again. Yeah. And today, every month is a new release. Uh, but times have changed since the American composer, Mrs. H.H.A. H. A. Beach, and you've heard of her. Mm-hmm. And she's a wonderful romantic American composer. I, I would rank her very close to McDowell. And uh, because she was a woman, Mrs. H. H. A. Beach, they said, oh, Mrs. Ha Ha Beach. And the idea of, you know, a woman composer was, was a fight. Uh, uh, Sir Thomas Beecham, who certainly never commissioned anything from a woman, said um, there never will be uh, a great woman composer. There never has been one and there never will be one. And he was adamant about such a thing. And yet, there's a new two-volume encyclopedia, which you're in, which you, I'm sure, know about, from a man in South Africa, Aaron Cohen. Do you know about the two volumes? It's an encyclopedia of I women might. composers from 800 A.D. And he spent half a million dollars in research. And it's an extraordinary book about women composers. And you're in it. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> okay. Am I last? No, I think we should... You are second from last. Well, what do you think? Z-W? <laughs> I mean, two volumes and you're second from last. Photograph and everything. Uh, Ellen, um, what were your great influences? As you mentioned before, you, were, uh, you got a doctorate from Juilliard, but the fact is you were also the first woman to ever get a doctorate in uh, composition there. Um, you studied there a bit with Sessions, I think? Mainly with Roger Sessions, yeah. And a little with Carter, perhaps? With Carter, yeah. Your music, of course, is not like either. They're very thorny and cerebral, and yours is extremely complex, I think, but very, very accessible. People get it. I think the rhythmical element in yours uh, uh, is wonderful. I can't classify you. I don't hear great influences in you. you. Are you one of these rare birds that is really an original mind? Um... You know, I, I don't take my pulse every 10 seconds as a, as a composer, and um, 
I'm always amazed when, when people are so interested in, you know, what influences something. Because I, I really think if you have an original voice, it, it's there. You know, you really don't have to look for it or seek to have it. I mean, I think it's, it's either genuinely in you or it isn't. Um, and yet we're, we're, I think the 20th century has given us a rich, rich field of, of uh, influence. And um, I, I think particularly um, the kind of um, wide open sort of schooling that, that um, is possible now, where you, you not, don't learn just a particular tradition, but you, you, you have knowledge and possibility of hearing oh, all yes. kinds of world music and yes. um, all kinds of other music other than, uh -huh. let's say, the, what you might call the classical tradition. Yeah. How come classical music in the 20th century just has not done that elaborately well? For instance, 20th century painting has, but people cringe at it, and you know that there's not the same audience, or maybe there is, who knows, that there once was, but what do you think of this, this question? It comes up with many composers that there's just not an audience for uh, contemporary serious art music. Um, I don't think that's true. How come? Um, I see an audience growing. Um, I've, I have just had one experience after another at vastly different places. Um, for instance, um, I just heard my second symphony in Akron, Ohio, and a pretty darn good performance, too, the Akron Symphony. Um, and the response, I mean, here you are in the heartland, you know, the mm -hmm. Midwest. The response was wonderful. Did you go before and uh, perhaps educate that audience in your work? I went, I did something for, I don't know, maybe three, three, four hundred people mm -hmm. before the concert, but certainly not the whole yeah, audience. Yeah. I think the audiences are, you know, have gotten something of a bum rap. I think they're, they're much more interesting than, mm -hmm. than people think. I do think that, that we have a problem of not having a general musical literacy. Uh, so a lot of people are somewhat um, put off by music in, in general. Um, however, I, I always remind myself that it, it's wonderful to think in global terms, and I like to do this um, from time to time and think about the era and what's going on. But when you think about the history of music in very specific ways, what Haydn did in a tiny little place in, in um, outside, 90 miles away from Vienna, where his musicians were just dying to get out of there, and, and where the people that, you know the people that came to the Esterhazy Palace to hear the latest Haydn creation were probably more interested in what, their, what clothes they had on sure. and so on. What he did was so much more than was ever asked of him. When Bach was writing those cantatas, um, for the, the, the congregation on, on Sunday. It was so much more than needed to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the history of music is people doing great and wonderful things that are, that are really, um, have outgrown their, their, their circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, we, we tend to think of the, the mega concert, you know, the superstar, the, you know, this kind of thing, but that's, you know, Art, again, is a very, it's a very human endeavor. And, and um, I, I think one of the problems we have in the, in the modern world is balancing the desire to open up more people's ears to possibilities in music and the desire to go for large numbers. Sometimes something that happens in a room full of 45 or 50 people is more important than something that happens in a stadium with 70,000. Absolutely. Now, what do you mean, uh, the musical, the turn-off of music? You said many people are just turned off of it in a way. Well, I think if, if you want to be uh, truly honest about it, if you, if you say contemporary music um, to most people in American culture, this means a Madonna, you know, and... Um, they, it's not that they know about Aaron Copeland and Carl Heinz Stockhausen and they don't like it. They don't know about it. 
Uh, you think that they would like it if they knew about it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's um, a good chance, of course. Uh, you never know. Yeah. I mean, it's like playing music for children. You can say, oh, gee, they're going to love you know, this. This is a nice kitty piece, and they don't, but you put on the Mahler Ninth, and they love it. And you, you know, It's very hard to figure what people are going to respond to. You never know. I mean, to. There's always a change in, in each era. I'll never forget uh, when I was music director of WNCN in the late uh, or early 70s, and this is, I mean, absolutely incredible story. Stockhausen was a very big cultural hero all over, in, including the United States. And there was a program called Anniversary Concert. I don't know if you remember Yes, it. sure, I remember that. Seven to eight o'clock, and every day would be someone who else, who, uh, whoever was born on that day. And uh, at that time, I had tremendous freedom to do what I wanted. And uh, in fact, I built a, a, quite a myth about artistic you know, integrity and so forth, and that the public should hear contemporary music on radio, which of course, Today we're lucky to hear um, a Vivaldi slow movement. That's too slow. Uh, but um, I had put on Stockhausen's work for seven to eight. Now this, of course, is is um, dinner time, and the general manager at that time of WNCN was dining, and he. Um, he heard this incredible music, uh, this electronic, this on it. He says, my God, I've got to call the station. He calls the station. The announcer says yes. He said, w get this off the air. No, no. He said, this, are you having transmission problems? <laughs> and Lucian Ricard said, oh, no, this is, proud. This is Stockhausen's birthday stand. And he said, oh, oh, I'm sorry, and hung up. Now today, of course, you know, I mean, you'd be fired instantly. So times have changed. I don't think we have, uh, we've uh, progressed at all in the musical literacy. And that is one of the greatest problems this country faces in almost everything. They don't, Madonna is the, the, the art of music, not Aaron Copland, as you say. There is absolutely no discrimination. Now the moment there is discrimination and one is educated is very, very difficult to um, hear bad music after you've come to love good music. Don't you think so? But there is a musicalization of the world. A literacy is forming in the young that their only communication with the world is through what I call junk music, but it actually saves their lives. I was in a cab recently. I got in. It was so loud I thought I'd die. And I said, could you turn the rock and roll off? He said, get out of the cab. <laughs> he much prefers rock and roll to my fare. So I think we're in trouble uh, in, in that, uh, I don't mean taxi driving, but I mean, I, I think that the discrimination is, is not being taught in schools. Uh, uh, in a bank, I said Should to some- said, are you talking to me? I'm the yeah. only one here. <laughs> <laughs> and what can I do now? great line from taxi driver. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Well, I don't, I don't know. I, I think um, the world is always coming to, the, to an end, and you know, it's also never coming to an end, hopefully. Um, I, I don't have, my only problem with, with pop music and rock and roll is when, that's, when people think that that's all there is. Like I say, if, if they know what there is and they reject everything but that, I don't have a problem with it. Um, I think the problem with, with our country is that we don't really have a strong enough education. Yeah. What did you feel when Aaron Copeland and Bernstein and Virgil Thompson died? Uh, did, you, did you feel that this was a, a uh, without Copeland, there was no major name left? In fact, if you look at the world's music, there is no major figure Messian is just not known outside of France. Ludoslavsky is not known out of Poland. All these major, uh, and they get performed all over, and but yet... But you know, David, that's, that's, in a way that's like saying there were no great people born in, in 1982. No, but what I'm saying is that the world may not have known of Stravinsky's music or saw Picasso's paintings, but they knew that name. It symbolized that art. And that, that frightens me a little that we don't have any symbol that 
the masses relates to as, oh, Aaron Copland was our great composer. Uh, there was someone, a uh, um, very important musician on, on television that was talking about Charles Eves. <laughs> well, and he was a rather important musician. <laughs> I mean, this is not good. Now, obviously, in our discussion, we, we, we're having problems since I am a major pessimist and you see things that are not as bad. And, of course, in your own well, world, it, it is good. You know, it's, it's a very, um, I don't know. I, I think that, that, again, one has to walk a tightrope um, in, in so many ways. I think writing music is a very existential act. I mean, you really know it's, it's futile and... And yet you do it with all your heart and soul and everything you can bring to it. Um, and you, there's a fine line to walk in, in a lot of these things between um, having a, an understanding of what the problems of your culture are and having an understanding of what the strengths are. I think there's certain incredible stylistic strengths of, of being a musician at this time. Um, I think there's a, a rekindled interest in American um, music. There's um, definitely um, the performers are just really getting very, very excited about what's going on. Um, and that's the first audience for a, a composer, I believe. Or the second, sure. after yourself. Yeah, after yourself. But, uh, Let's hear a little bit more of Ellen Zillick's music. What do you want to hear now? Uh, well, the next thing we had up was the second movement of my flute concerto, which is a little you want to do very that? different, I guess, yes. We didn't say that that would be the last thing we would hear? Well, um, well I, we're going to have time? Or yes, gonna, absolutely. Okay. Um, we can hear a, a little bit of... Uh, okay, we, we have up Cymbalon, right? Yeah. yeah um, we'll, no, this we'll, is a piece that the New York Philharmonic commissioned in uh, 88, um, this was the, the first American symphonic work ever premiered in the Soviet Union. Mm. And um, it was quite an experience for me. Did you go? Oh, yes. Oh, and nice. um, I mean, we had a dress rehearsal in Leningrad, you know, so it was, it was really very, very hot off the press. Um, and it was, this is on a recording by Zubin Mehta in the New York Philharmonic. And this is one of those recordings that composers dream about because they had performed it I think 14 mm. times. He took it on three, the Soviet tour and a tour of Europe and a tour of Asia. So the recording session was, oh you know, putting down just what you want. So how many times were you able to hear it yourself? Um, well, I heard it in the Soviet Union and I heard it when they did it. They did it a few times on subscription mm. here, mm. but um, I didn't go on the other tours. Mm. Um, but this was a work that um, was written right at the time when the um, Reagan and Gorbachev were signing the SALT Treaty and all this kind of thing, and there was, a, for the first time in my life, a sense of that maybe politically we were not going to be at war with the, with the Soviet Union. And of course, as a, a musician, uh, one of my violin teachers was Richard Bergen, who was born in St. Petersburg and was an hour student and mm. so on. Another was Galamian. Who was, Galamian. You know, I didn't know you studied with the, the biggies. In violin, and you're not practicing? No, I don't oh. have time. I don't even have any calluses. Okay. Um, and of course, the Russian music has meant so much to us. And um, I mean, I think people who say they don't like Shostakovich have no heart. I think the music just has to touch you. Sure. Um, and there's every indication in the art, certainly in the music, that we're absolutely related and kin, um, and yet virtually my whole life has been this, you know, the Cold War. Yeah. Um, and so my piece is called Symbolon, which is a, uh, refers to, it's an ancient Greek term, and it refers to the practice of breaking something in two, and you keep half and I keep half, mm. and each half is called a Symbolon, and it is... Um, I mean, it, for me, it was a very rich idea of um, association, that even to the extent that one needs one another mm -hmm. to, to make something whole. And um, it's a gesture of friendship and goodwill. And Tell me, how long is this work? Well, the work is about 16 minutes. So we'll we hear, hear about two or three minutes. hear a little bit of it. So a little taste of it.
It's kind of interesting for me to hear this piece in a way because I remember thinking at the time um, my feelings, which are very complicated. Um, I think I ranged from the feeling of sadness to hope in a way about the world situation. And I figured I would just um, not even think about the emotional affect of I would just write my piece and worry about the form of it and the concept of it in time and so on and, and giving the Philharmonic enough to, to play. And, um, but the feelings come out very, I think, very um, without really trying. Yeah. Maybe even... The... Um, you're a very serious woman about your composing. I mean, from the day I met you, I knew that, you know, this is a composer that lives and breathes putting down those notes and you love it. Tell us a little bit about a composer's life. Uh, people understand a, a violinist getting up and practicing and so forth, but how do you compose music? You know, Elgar uh, was once with uh, Bernard Shaw and uh, with um, Roger Fry, the artist uh, aesthetician, and uh, they were all talking about their, you know, painters do this, and uh, Shaw was saying, this is how I write plays, and Elgar was looking at them like uh, they were crazy. He said, Music? I don't know how I compose music. It's, it's in the air. <laughs> tell, tell me about how you compose music. Um, the, the interesting thing is that I'm sure you discovered many years ago that each composer has a very different answer. Um, I, I think that um, the most difficult thing to talk about and to articulate and even to yourself to understand uh, in a non-musical way is the, the fact that what we do is in time. Mm -hmm. And it's the most important element in it. We have architectural designs, for instance, um, A, B, A, or even sonata form. These are things you could put on a blackboard, yeah. and they're roughly comparable to other kinds of forms in space. But the question of not that the A thing returns, but when does it return, is the critical thing. How long is, does it last? Um, and you can certainly see from, um, for instance, the Beethoven piano sonatas, which you must know inside out, each one is quite different, and yet they, they often fit the same architectural form. But how long that first subject lasts? Um, the interesting thing about Beethoven to me, and probably the reason I think of him as kind of the first really modern composer, um, is that he had this thing that, that they're beginning to talk about now in, in mathematics, the notion that of the dependence on initial events, mm -hmm. where a, a sonata that starts one way has a short lifespan, a, a sonata that starts another way has a long lifespan. Yes. And what happens, particularly in the initial stages, influences what comes afterward. Um, so I, I think about form in every way that I can, and, and uh, the, the most difficult thing perhaps is to um, carry that span of time mm -hmm. and to, to fully understand what span of time your, your piece wants to occupy. Yes, in, in that sense we, we have something very much in common. You notice that every time I've asked you about a piece, I, how long is it? Mm -hmm. I'm always listening to a work in its time cycle, in, in its events. But it's interesting how sometimes a short piece can seem very, very eventful. Yes. And a long piece can seem, you know, uneventful. Yeah. Or con contrary, the long piece can seem very yes. short. Yes. And a short piece can last forever. I mean, it's, it's all, th this is an area that we have really almost no vocabulary That's right. yes. to talk about, and it's the most important area. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a great deal of talk about harmony, um, but there again, you know, it's to me it's only one of the aspects. Yes. So, to make a, a long story short, what I do, I try to get myself to that final product as, as soon as possible. For instance, when I'm writing for orchestra, I will actually make up paper for that whole orchestra, even though it means I sketch on these huge pieces of paper. I, I will always use musical instruments when, when I work to, to get the feeling of how it flows, how it sounds. 
Um, I like to think of gestures, um, things that throw you into that time hmm. area. Um, so I do all kinds of things hmm. um, when, I'm, when I'm writing. Now, what is the place uh, for inspiration? For instance, do you ever, uh, Berlioz once said uh, when he was very poor, he had to survive doing hack work at the library of the Paris Conservatory. He woke up and he said, oh my God, a whole symphony I dreamed and I don't have time to put it down because I have to make a living. You see, this of course is arts for, art for art's sake, one of the great dupes of the modern age in my opinion. But um, he had no chance to do it, he had to go to work. But the idea of dreaming music, is done. that part? Oh, is, dreaming music, yeah, do definitely. Do you ever dream? Oh, absolutely. You, new things come to you through your dreams? Are you in touch with that aspect? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I think the, the bottom line is that we don't know where it comes from. It, it may, Elgar may have been right. It may yeah. be the air, it may be God, it may be dreams. Who knows? Yeah, Brahm said, I'm taking a walk and a colonel comes to me. And that's very easy, he said. And then, God in heaven, the labor I go through. Yeah, and he, interestingly enough about Brahms, he's the, the, um, one of the few composers whose labor really worked. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I mean, you know the, the B major trio, for instance. Opus that, 9, yeah. Eight. That early version has all this wonderful God-given material, and it's, it's full of fugatos and all kinds of unnecessary stuff mm -hmm. that he, very late in life, went back to and reworked, and it sounds fresh and spontaneous, yeah. and it's wonderful. So in spite of his complaining, his work, I think, added up tremendously. He was an amazing man. He was, he was actually taking counterpoint lessons in his old age, just to constantly keep his hand in the technique. Well, also, you know, uh, it's it's very funny. I like to feel that I'm, I'm just on the threshold. You know, this. Well, you're a very young composer. The piece I'm doing now. This is just the threshold, and I think um, one of the really exciting things about writing instrumental music um, that I I just I love spending my life in this. I really do. And you're always learning things. And um, the series of concertos I've done has been um, tremendously rewarding to me because mm -hmm. of that. And Tell us, the, what, what are the series? There's the flute concerto, the oboe concerto, there's a big piano concerto. Uh, um, well, the first concerto I wrote is the concerto for trumpet and five players. It, we heard a little snippet of. Mm -hmm. The second one was the piano concerto. Um, then I've, um, I got a commission from the Chicago Symphony um, for a concerto for trombone and orchestra. And I wrote a concerto for trombone and rather large orchestra that um, Schulte did with Jay Friedman mm. a couple of years ago. Um, followed by a concerto for bass trombone, strings, timpani, and cymbals, also for the Chicago Symphony that was just premiered. Um, I wrote a flute concerto for Dario Dwyer with the Boston Symphony and the, the tape we have up is Seiji Ozawa conducting Boston with Dario. Um, the oboe concerto for John Mack and the Cleveland Orchestra. I will be doing a bassoon concerto for the Pittsburgh Symphony. You want to go through every instrument? Uh, no. No, <laughs> I have some that I don't want to do. A violin concerto yet? Um, I threw one away a long time ago. But you but have I done a violin sonata. A, yes. yes, I do. I'm yes. writing a uh, double concerto for Jamie Laredo and Sharon Robinson in Louisville. Mm -hmm. It'll be done in December. Now, obviously, you're getting commissions all the time, and you're going to be working straight. Uh, <laughs> uh, last time I was here with Ned Rohrm, and I asked him, uh, I, uh, would you compose if, if um, you weren't commissioned? And he said, no, he wouldn't. Of course, I don't believe no, him. No, I don't believe him either. Uh, you know, but it's true that, you know, you can compose in isolation. But composers ought to be, as all artists, ought to be members of, of the world that they live in, not locked up in Act 3 of La Boheme. They should be, um, I mean, for instance, if I'm writing for the Chicago Symphony, do you honestly, could, would you believe me if I said that wasn't inspiring? Just knowing this great orchestra is going to walk on the stage and play sure. my piece. And not only that, but they can play it so well. I mean, yeah. That's, that's the... And I'm coming back to the Philharmonic for mm -hmm. my third symphony. Now this is an orchestra that's recorded for my pieces. And it's like, I mean, I just feel just, you know, like it's a wonderful feeling for a composer. It, mm -hmm. it is inspiring. Yeah. 
Um, you love instruments. You've done vocal music, songs, and so forth. Uh, what about an opera in your future? Are you interested in that kind of music? Um, well, not for me. Mm -hmm. Not for me, mm -hmm. because I, again, I believe um, I, I'm a great dirt under the fingernails um, <laughs> a believer. I, I think you've got to learn building on your strengths, going where you know and learning constantly about it. I've been living in instrumental music since I was in junior high school, mm -hmm. and I'm learning something all the no. time about it. Yeah. To, to jump, you know, it's a kind of a cruelty inflicted on some American composers to jump immediately into a, a three-act opera yes. when, you know, when you really don't know how what happens backstage. Yes. You, you really have to have um, <clears throat> music in your blood, and I... I remember years ago when your symposium, one, the first orchestral work that I remember of yours, um, a marvelous piece, uh, Boulez did it with the New York Philharmonic. And obviously from the beginning of your career, only the biggest of the big have been interested in you. I mean, this is marvelous. And uh, I remember there was this wonderful uh, occasion you had that you, I, I, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, you were able to, to work with Boulez and tell him exactly what you wanted as a composer. You mean on the stage? Yeah. Well, yes, he always had, he always liked to involve the composer. And so what he said, asked me to do was to sort of quasi-rehearse the piece with him on stage. He's so formidable that it would be terrifying, it seems, to, to work with him. But oh. he, he loved your music. Well, um, you know, I think it depends on, on what your game is. If you're out to, to um, best somebody with ego or something, then, then that's difficult. But I have never, ever had a problem with, I mean, with Daniel Berenboim, Sir George Schulte, Seiji Ozawa, Zubin Mehta, Boulez. It's never been a problem. I have found every one of these people mm. to be, um, you know, how can we make it better? Mm. Did you, is this a good tempo? You like mm, this? You know, mm. I mean, it's, I have never Accommodating found... Accommodating totally, yes. Um, maybe it's a whole new era. Um, I can remember uh, Stokowski not being terribly interested in what composers had to say, but I, <laughs> I haven't found it. But that was Stokowski, yes. Yeah. Yes. But we, uh, you know, I mean, I just, I think that the, um, the finest people usually are the best collaborators. You know, we're going to hear now, fortunately, a whole movement of the flute concerto by Ellen Zwillick. Uh The middle movement, the yeah, slow movement? Yeah, this is the slow movement. It's, um, I thought it'd be a contrast to the... And Ozawa in the Boston Symphony? Mm -hmm. And Dory Anthony Dwyer. Let's hear audiences have TB. <coughs> <coughs>
Almost exactly a year from now, um, Mazur will be doing this with Jeannie Backstresser at the Philharmonic. Mm. So please come. <laughs> what a beautiful, just sheer loveliness. Ellen, I want to thank you so much for coming. You are a divine guest. Uh, just thank you. Beautiful. Uh, concerto. Oh, my. Thank you. I just not listening to your work. <laughs> I want to remind you that this series continues uh, with a real American classic next uh, Friday, Morton Gould, and then on the, that's the 24th, and the 29th, John Corleano, and June 7th, the 91-year-old, the most wonderful man, Otto, Otto Luning. <laughs> Just wonderful. So try to come, and uh, thank you very much, and please come up and say hello to Ellen. Yeah. <laughs>